Okay, so um, okay, I just want to make sure that everything that I can see everything here. Okay, now I'm going to go back to my screen. All right, and put this over here. Okay. So I just want a little bit of background on the audience. Can you all see my uh, screen okay? Please just type in that everything you can see, my screen is okay. Uh, yes, it's perfect. Screen is Wonderful. Fine. We can see Bill Clinton. You got, you got some, you got see, you can, okay. Excellent, excellent. So they're all saying they can see it. Yeah. Good, excellent. And yeah. how about, uh, okay. So do a little hand raise if you can. I just want to see who's in my audience. Uh, anybody here is already vegan? Tell me if you're um, vegan. It's nice to just see who's there. I can unmute all of them and they can speak. Sure, yeah, you can unmute everybody. Yes, I did. Hi, everyone. Maybe here, everyone, we have unmuted you. You can speak. Hi, everyone. They're writing. Oh, you're writing. Okay, that's good. Yeah, so... Uh, uh, is it Tushar is asking, is everybody's vegan here or yeah, who's somebody vegan, who's aspiring uh, vegan? Somebody's vegan who's aspiring vegan and maybe who is uh, not even vegan. Maybe no, you're not even vegetarian, but you're interested in these kind of things. You know, I like to see the mix of people. So then, okay. Yeah, so there is a Regan who says he's not vegan. There's Kumkum, uh -huh. she's yeah. vegan. There's Bukesh yeah, who's yeah. vegan. Jay is there as well. He's vegan. Good, good. So, so it's nice to have a, a mix of people, you know? Okay, yeah. so what I'm going to do is, I, so these guys, this, this, this over here in the top left, that's Dave Scott. Okay, go ahead. Uh, Tushar, you are mute by mistake or whatever. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I told Tushar, can you oh, check your... Go. That was ah, my mistake. Now it's, now it's perfect. Uh, okay, okay. Now you can hear me. Sorry about that. Okay. Yes. So let's start. Yeah. Okay. Um, sorry, I was mute all that time. I don't know how it happened. Okay. So, yes. So Dave Scott in the top, uh, top left. Can you see my cursor? Does my cursor show up? Um, yes. It does. Okay. Good. So... Dave Scott is one of the top Ironman champions of the world. He won the Iron. He was the first guy to win the world Ironman champion more than once. He won it. Tushar, can you speak a little bit louder or something? Is it possible? Then we sure. can even yeah, have yeah. better. Yeah. Yeah. Let me do that. Okay. So Dave Scott is in the top left. His name is Dave Scott. He's the first guy to hear to win the world Ironman competition more than one time in a row, and he won it six times continuously. And when he was doing this competition, he was vegan. Okay. And uh, so that's an interesting race. You have to swim four kilometers, then uh, cycle 180 kilometers, and then run 42 kilometers. That's the Ironman. And so he was the world champion of that. He was vegan you know, at the time. So he was one of the first vegan athletes. Bill Clinton went vegan to help his heart disease, Mike Tyson, and, and uh, David Carter in the bottom right. He's a vegan football player. He's call, he call, calls himself a 300-pound vegan because he's a linebacker, and his position is to be very, very big guy. And, um, you know, and he's uh, you know, on, a, on a vegan diet doing this, right? So it's showing that uh, people can gain muscle. One of the world's strongest men, Patrick Baboumian, he won you know, he broke various world records and he's won the Germany Strongest Man competition uh, on a vegan diet. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Siba Johnson, one of the first, uh, he, she is the first black Olympic skier and was the youngest Olympic skier ever and she was vegan and she still is. Um, Jake Shields and some other UFC fighters have been vegan. Serena Williams. Okay, so there's been, and of course, our friends like these elephants, the elephant here, also vegan, right? And same with me. So as far as uh, me, I was just an introduction of myself. I uh, did my residency in family medicine here in University of Toronto. And um, I went to, I, I did my residency in family medicine. Now I do emergency medicine. I work in India every year for a number of years in a small village area in Kutch. And I also do some environmental work and I'm very interested in plant-based nutrition and vegan diet and health and the environment. Uh, and also Jiv there, and I like to show people how all these things go together. Okay, all right. 
So vegan diet, nutritional science, rock and roll. All right. Now, see, this is some of the people that I learned from, people like Dr. Michael Greger, nutritionfacts.org, great uh, website to go to. Jack Norris from veganhealth.org. He's a registered dietitian, fantastic resource about knowledge for vegan diet and health. Jeannie Messina, they work together. Jack Norris, Jeannie work together a lot. Neil Barnard, he works from PCRM, pcrm.org is another um, uh, organization you should know about in terms of vegan diet and health. You can go to their website and get information. They also have, PCRM has an India branch that helps people you know, become, do a, you know, like 21 day challenge or something like that for Indian food that give you lots of recipes of Indian food that can be veganized. And so they're really great. So, uh, and this is a book that I think is great. It's called Vegan for Life, uh, written by Jack Norris and Jeannie Messina. It's a great book about everything about vegan diet and health. And it's very up to date in terms of the medical evidence. Okay. So I have three objectives in this presentation. First is to teach people about what is uh, science versus what is opinion and why science matters and what is considered science and what data do we have secondly about the prevention of disease with a vegan diet and thirdly how can you optimize your vegan diet right now in india many of the people listening they may be vegetarian so uh you may not be eating meat but still eating dairy so the focus i'll try to make the focus a little bit more about dairy as we go on okay you know and we want to you know, as a doctor, I want to increase people, public health, the average health of people in the society. I want to increase that. You know, but if already somebody is vegetarian or vegan, I want to show you how you can maximize your health. So this is a good uh, slide that I like to start with. And that is that BKS Iyengar practiced yoga all his life and died yesterday at the age of 96. Kushwant Singh drank whiskey all his life and died at the age of 99. And the moral of the story is that whiskey gives you a three-year edge over yoga. Okay, so it's a funny slide. Uh, everybody, everybody always loves it. But what it shows you is that everybody knows this is not true, right? That uh, um, yoga doesn't necessarily give you a life until 96. And uh, whiskey doesn't necessarily make you live until 99. But what these are, these are individual examples, what we call anecdotes. And everybody can have a cousin who, uh, or an uncle that eats meat, and smokes, you know, a pack a day of cigarettes and does not wear their seatbelt in the car and does every dangerous thing, but still they live until they're, you know, 105 years old, you know. But what medical science is, is that medical science is made up of averages, okay? So we need science because it helps us be uh, objective, okay? And, and there's two kinds of sciences. There's sciences that are what we call basic sciences. Basic sciences are things that we do in an animal, we do in the test tube, we look at genetics, and we look at molecular biology, and we, we see all those things. Those are called basic sciences. It sees how things work in the body, okay, in biology, okay? And then there is what we call clinical science. Clinical science is what we do in humans. And we look at people over a long period of time and we look at a lifestyle factor such as your diet or we look at medications and we see what happens to people over a long time taking this medication or doing some kind of intervention, okay? And that's clinical science. Now, we take basic science, we generate ideas, we may design a medication that we think that was going to work according to our test tube studies or maybe somebody tested it in an animal. But that doesn't necessarily actually mean it works in a human. You actually have to test it out in a group of humans. So you have to do a study. So what we do is we take a large number of people. Let's say you take, you have a medication and you're testing it to see if it works. You may test it in, let's say, 50,000 people. And you have two groups, you know, 50,000 people, you test the medication, let's say something for blood pressure. And in the other 50,000 people, you test a placebo. And then you see over... Uh, let's say 10 years, who, how many people get a heart attack in the group A versus group B. And nobody knows who's taking a placebo, who's taking the actual pill. And we find out over time if this thing's actually helping us to prevent heart attacks. Okay. So that's what we like to do is we like to compare different people over time. And we want to make sure that the groups of people are the same. That one group is not younger than the other group or that uh, they're not... Uh, one group is more poor. The other group on the average has higher income. We want to make sure that one is not more women. The other is more men or things like that. We want to make sure that the main characteristics, education level, income, all those things are very similar in the two groups. Okay. That's going to be very important. All right. And 
So we do lots of clinical studies to test drugs, treatments, diagnosis, you know, and also nutrition. Okay. So there's different kinds of studies that we have. Okay. And I'm not going to get too much into the different studies, but mainly the principle is that we like to see that there are um, enough people in each group, the groups are similar, and that we're comparing relevant characteristics of each group. Okay. So clinical studies are always done on humans. And as I mentioned, the control or comparison group has to be, has to be good. And uh, we like to make sure that age, gender, smoking, body mass index, and different habits are very relevant. Okay. And that they're done over appropriate time period. So that's when you have like a good study. Now there's various studies in the world who will test, you know, uh, about diet and they, many of them will look at people eating, you know, very, very small amounts of animal products to people eating a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more and uh, to the standard amount. And then they compare them over time. There's also a couple of studies, uh, one done in the USA and one done in the Europe. Okay. The Adventist studies in USA and the, um, uh, uh, European European prospective investigation into cancer. There's a group of people there in the UK that are comparing vegans versus vegetarians versus semi-vegetarians versus people who only eat fish and people on standard diet. So there are some studies going like that, but it's still difficult because there's still not that many vegans to study in comparison to these other groups. But still, they have a few. You know, they have a few in the US. They have maybe four thousand in the two thousand five hundred in the European group, but it's still less than the other people. You know. So the Adventist and Epic studies, as I mentioned, okay. And all right. So what I like people to do is I like to make sure that people don't just believe what I say, but instead people are actually looking at the research and um, I want to make sure that everybody has access to my articles. So the talk that I'm giving right now, you'll find a similar talk online and uh, uh, this is one thing if you, you can take note of. If you just type my first name, Tushar, and then vegan, Tushar vegan, and see which videos come up. There's one video where you see a green apple in the front, and that video is the one, it's sort of my best, better video online. And from there, you click the see more uh, um, button, and then you can download all of my references as well. So you can share that video with people also. So let's talk about the diseases that can be prevented with a vegan diet. All right, so uh, the main diseases that can be prevented are um, heart disease, okay? Heart disease and diabetes. Heart disease and diabetes, we can really, really reduce the amount of heart disease and diabetes if somebody is on a healthy vegan diet, okay? So an unhealthy vegan diet is going to give you very minor advantages, but a healthy vegan diet is where we're gonna get the most advantages. So we're gonna talk about what constitutes an optimized, healthy vegan diet, okay? Um, and then there's some cancers that can be decreased as well. Uh, so total death from cancer is somewhat decreased. Maybe there's a 20% decrease in total cancer mortality. Some people say that if you become vegan, it's going to make you cancer-proof, like you should never get cancer, but that's not true, okay? Nothing can make us cancer-proof. There's nothing that can do that, okay? Um, but you can reduce the amount of cancer. So total cancer mortality uh, can be reduced. As well, uh, breast and prostate are two important cancers and some other ones like colon cancer can also, um, can also be reduced. All right. So let's see. So other diet issues, things like constipation, diverticulitis, inflammatory bowel disease, you know, some of these other things uh, you know, can also be improved. Some infectious diseases and antibiotic resistance are important concepts as well. Here's what a medical study looks like. This one is published in 1999. At that time, they didn't have many vegans. And so it's called uh, Association Between um, Diet, Cancer, Ischemic Heart Disease, and All-Cause Mortality in Hispanic White California Seventh-day Adventists. So those are the kind of titles you get in these medical studies. studies. And um, there was 34,000 subjects followed over 12 years. 37% lower cardiovascular death in the vegetarians as, as compared to those eating meat. And the vegetarians lived longer. This is a North American study. Remember that, okay? Men live 3.2 3 years longer and uh, women about 5.2 years, uh, sorry, 2.5 years longer, okay? So um, people living a little bit longer, all right? Um, 
and this is a more recent study in the Journal of the American Medical Association, uh, showed that you know, vegans had about 15% less mortality compared to other groups when you followed them over a six year period approximately. And uh, so again, showing some positive things that in this study, even people who are vegetarian or semi-vegetarian had some benefits, okay? They all had benefits by reducing the amount of animal products in their diets, okay? And one of the four, you know, I don't want to just talk about veganism by itself all the time because there's other factors that are also showing that we can uh, live longer. Uh, and this is from a study of the European Perspective Investigation into Cancer, but they're just showing that in terms of longevity, people who had the lower meat intake lived longer, especially when they ate a lot of whole plant foods and whole grains, okay? So not white flour related foods, but whole grains, uh, as well as having low meat. Uh, that they exercised, that they didn't smoke, and that they were slim. BMI means body mass index, and that's a rating of how slim you are. So people who were slimmer, tended to live longer than those people who are very obese, okay? And people have heard of the China study, which showed a great decrease in heart disease, but it's an old study. And we have newer studies than the China study, but the China study did show that people eating more greens, low salt, more lentils, and less meat had you know, advantages compared to those who were and also very low fat, um, had advantages compared to people who were eating more animal products, okay? And in 1990, Dean Ornish, a very, very famous doctor, put people on a whole food, very low fat, plant-based diet and showed that you can increase, you can reverse heart disease. It's the first, first um, study to ever show that you can reverse heart disease in a coronary artery that had blockages. So the, arter, you know, the artery on the left has blockages. And the same person one year later, after they're on a very low fat vegan diet, now, you can't reverse every single uh, blockage in an artery because some of them develop calcium and they become very hardened. But the softer ones that have not developed calcium, if you're on a very, very low fat diet, um, in less than 10% of calories from fat, um, and on a whole food plant-based diet, then you can actually reverse diabetes and reverse heart disease. So that's pretty amazing. Okay. Um, so again, showing you know, more studies where people who are vegetarian, eating low meat, had uh, lower risk of heart disease. Okay. And people like Bill Clinton you know, went on a vegan diet also for the same reason. And we also find that, we also theorize that you know, there hasn't been good studies on it, but that the stroke can be possibly less. Now, stroke occurs less in general, so it's harder to study. And other blood vessel disease, so blood vessel disease in the legs, blood vessel disease in arms and what we call peripheral vascular disease, which is also a major cause of erectile dysfunction. And we find that diabetic, diabetic men, you know, they have three to four times higher rates of erectile dysfunction than, uh, than men without diabetes. And this is likely because of a, a blood vessel disease that accompanies the diabetes as well as other changes that, you know, uh, high blood sugar and those kind of things affect the nerves, okay? So there's a lot of things that can be improved with um, uh, a plant-based diet uh, or can be made worse, you know, with, uh, um, uh, with eating animal-based foods will come to diabetes more, okay? So now when it comes to cancer, what we, we can look at all cancers taken together and then some specific cancers, okay? So this was a 2012 study showing that vegetarians uh, had a 29% lower heart disease and about an 18% lower total cancer mortality than non-vegetarians. Now, this study wasn't uh, distinguishing vegans versus non-vegans, non, uh, uh, sorry, vegans versus other types of vegetarians, but they were just sort of grouping vegetarians together and they found that there was a lower rate of cancer. It's a good study, okay? And here's one on breast cancer, showing that people who are eating the most meat, there was not studying vegetarians per se, it was just showing people who had the lowest meat intake versus the highest meat intake. And those with the higher meat intakes had you know, 20% and up to 60% higher rates of breast cancer uh, compared to those who are eating the least amount of meat in that group. Okay? And we often worry with breast cancer that if soy, has anybody heard, that soy is bad for breast cancer. Tell me if you've heard that. We have a 
nine pound lists. Put up your hand if you've heard that soy is a risk for breast cancer. Can you put up your hand? Can you see uh, in the thing? Who has heard that soy can be a risk for women because it has estrogen and it can increase breast cancer? Jay has heard that, okay? So this is something that you might hear, okay? But so people always say that, oh, soy has estrogens and it can increase breast cancer. Um, but in reality, when you actually study it, the, there's studies in Asia where they compare people who are eating largest amounts of soy compared to people who are eating moderate amounts and those who are eating lower amounts. And what the studies in Asia show that those people who are having one or more serving a day of soya since childhood have less breast cancer, okay? Have less breast cancer. Now there's many things that, um, oops, there are many things that affect breast cancer. So family history, genetics, uh, the early, the age where people menstruate, where a woman uh, starts her period, uh, the age of first pregnancy, how many times you've been pregnant, breastfeeding, whether you take hormone replacement after menopause, you know, those kind of things um, can influence your breast cancer risk. But saturated fat intake and animal protein intake also increase your cancer risk for the breast. And soy decreases the risk for breast cancer. And so soy consumption since childhood is a good way of protecting uh, people from cancer. And you get like 20, you know, people had like a good reduction in, um, uh, in cancer, like, a, you know, 30, 40%, you know, like we can, we can say that that's really good. It doesn't make it zero, but you can reduce it quite a bit. Um, okay. And so also sometimes people say that if you've had cancer, then consuming soy could be dangerous because if you have some residual, if there's some estrogen in the soy, then it would promote the breast cancer to grow again. But when they look at breast cancer survivors over in this particular study for about four years, and there's other studies that are that go over a longer time. They show that breast cancer survivors consuming more soy, you know, have maybe around 30% less recurrence of their cancer compared to those who are not consuming soy foods, and that uh, and that goes over. You know, they look at periods of four or five years. Um, going longer than that, who knows if there's you know eventually. Um, cancers do happen more in the people consuming soy, but at least for some time there's a protection. Okay. Now, prostate cancer is a similar problem. Okay. Those people who are consuming soy in Asian populations, in the Western populations, when they study breast cancer, prostate cancer, people aren't consuming so much soy. But in the East, when they look at people who are consuming a lot of soy as part of the traditional diet, like in China and Japan and those places, uh, people who are eating a lot of soy from childhood, they have 50% less breast, uh, prostate cancer, okay? And uh, other things that increase prostate cancer, eggs particularly increase prostate cancer. Eggs, red meat, and um, uh, chicken products increase prostate cancer in this study. And also whole milk. People consuming milk had increased prostate cancer. There was a, a large increase in people having whole milk. So is the, as opposed to the, the defatted milk, right? When they take all the fat out of milk, then it's uh, less cancer. So saturated fat, but also to some extent, the animal protein itself was promoting prostate cancer when it came to milk, okay, and dairy products. Uh, and prostate cancer and breast cancer are very important because they're, they're always, you know, lung cancer, prostate cancer, and breast cancer are the top cancers in men and women. Okay, those are the, the top cancers and a lot of the cancer mortality happens there, okay? Here's another study showing that vegans had 35% less cancer, prostate cancer, compared to other groups, you know, compared to non-vegans. And they did better than, uh, compared to, sorry, to, to non-vegetarians. And they did better than people who were just vegetarian or ate eggs. The people who were vegan had at least prostate cancer. So that's really great, okay? Now, we know that the WHO, the World Health Organization, has declared that red meat and processed meat are carcinogens, class 1, carcin car class one, class 1A and class 1B carcinogens. So that red meat means things like lamb, uh, mutton, beef, pork. Those are all red meats. They are shown to very probably 
uh, increase uh, colon cancer. And processed meats, so when people eat things like salami and pepperoni and bacon and all kinds of other stuff, maybe people are not eating those so much in India, but I know there are some people eating that. Uh, that does increase colon cancer risk. So being vegan does not mean you cannot get colon cancer. You can still get colon cancer. However, you decrease the risk of colon cancer, okay? And things like whole grains and uh, lentils, especially lentils, all the different dal is very, very good for you. It shows a decrease, okay? All right. So there's other things too, like so pancreas, cancer of the pancreas, okay? Um, having more lentils and legumes and more plant-based uh, reduces that. Gastric cancer, ovarian cancer, uh, is somewhat decreased with soy foods, but increased with meat, dairy, and, and fat intake, especially saturated fat, okay? Now let's come to next is diabetes, okay? Now diabetes, there's some statistics here from USA. I should pull some statistics from India, but if you Google diabetes and India, you're gonna find that diabetes is huge in India. And I'm sure that all of you have relatives who have diabetes, right? I'll be surprised if any of you had relatives who did not have diabetes. And that you end up having to take many medications. You end up, in many cases, taking insulin, which is giving needles to yourself. And then people have more kidney disease. Eventually, they get more heart disease. Sometimes they have to get a kidney transplant. And sometimes their leg, you know, they get so much blood vessel disease in their leg. Uh, and that they uh, have to have amputation of some of their toes or sometimes amputation of their foot or their leg because of the diabetes. People have very poor control of diabetes, okay, in some cases. So vegetarian diets um, are shown to have less diabetes, okay? But vegans are the champions of this. Compared to people having milk or having semi-vegetarian, uh, semi you know, so they're vegetarians, semi-vegetarians, compared to people eating milk, eggs, or other things, vegans have the lowest rates of diabetes. You can still get diabetes. You can still get it, you know? But even if you do get diabetes, it's going to be a, a milder form of diabetes in general. You know, some people have genetics that they have a bad diabetes no matter what, but that's very uncommon. But most people are going to have a much milder form of diabetes or they're going to prevent diabetes altogether. If somebody becomes vegan while they have diabetes, they're really going to uh, improve their diabetes, reduce their medications. In many cases, they might get off of the insulin. Uh, and in some cases, if they had a mild or moderate diabetes, they might reverse their diabetes altogether. Okay, And that's especially good evidence in people in a very low-fat, whole food, plant-based diet. Okay. Obesity, you know, now we know in India, there's a lot of obesity, a lot of obesity in India, people getting very overweight. So people who are vegan generally have a lesser body weight. Now there's still people who are vegan, who are very overweight. I see them and they're eating a lot more food than they need. You know, they're eating a lot of fried food, sweets, um, you know, uh, sweetened beverages like juices or colas, you know, so you have to be very careful of these foods. You should not eat those foods. But I say, well, you can eat a tiny bit, okay? You can eat a tiny bit. And, and obesity is important because people who are obese have higher rates of cancer, heart disease, menstrual problems. Um, they can get more arthritis in their knees, knees and back problems. I mean, we all get these things eventually. Everybody's going to get those, unfortunately, with age. But with a vegan diet, you can be slimmer and you can have less of those problems, okay? Um, so again, more data showing that there's less obesity, less blood pressure problems as well. People can have lower blood pressure if they're vegan as well. Okay, so that's also good. And now we also know that uh, now in India, there's less dementia. Somehow we have some genetic pr protection or maybe some of the foods that we eat, they theorize that eating turmeric may be preventive of dementia. But this is when people get very old and their memory and their brains don't function very well. And uh, it's a devastating disease. We see a lot of it here in North America. And people may be 80 years old and they get so bad, they can't drive anymore. They can't be independent. They can't take care of themselves. And in some cases, they cannot even remember the names of their family members. We know that higher cholesterol, higher blood sugars during your life can result in increased dementia later on. Okay. I just see. Um, Right. 
And Rupa Ben has made a comment that you see more old people suffering from memory loss degeneration of the brain in India now, right? So when we are older, we want to be physically healthy, we want our good heart health, we want to be able to run around, play with grandkids, but even climb a mountain, go on a vacation, travel around the world, travel around India, you know, and, um, and be very independent and have a, a good brain when we're 80 and 90 years old, right? So we know that the cholesterol saturated fat uh, intake and um, our blood sugar and those kind of things during our lifetime contribute to dementia later on. And one of the reasons is probably that people are having high blood, you know, are, are getting blood vessel disease. Okay. So the, the blood vessel, you know, the brain is full of, you know, blood vessels that go to every little tiny part of the brain. And these, they divide into small, small, tiny blood vessels. And then over time, when you start getting blockages in your blood vessels, okay, in the big vessels, you may get a partial blockage, but in the tiny vessels, some of them may get completely blocked and they're very, very tiny, less than a millimeter, like maybe 0.1 millimeter, 0.2 millimeters, some of these things. And you start getting blockages in all these little blood vessels. And so tiny, tiny, tiny parts of the brain start dying off brain cells dying off here and there and here and there everywhere. When we look on a CT scanner and you look at somebody, the brain kind of shrinks and you see little areas of the brain that kind of have, have had uh, tiny, mini, mini strokes, like tiny, tiny little strokes throughout the brain. And that is one of the major factors of dementia. That's not the only factor, but it's one of the major factors. So, um, you know, we get, uh, you know, dementia is very terrible when, when it's severe and it's very hard for the whole family. So this, again, like anything, we always, I always like to say that being vegan doesn't mean you are unable to get a problem, but you can reduce the risk of the problem. You can reduce the amount of problem and that's very important. Okay. So, um, and especially if we're on a healthy vegan diet, if you're not on a healthy vegan diet, if you're on a um, if you're on a vegan diet that's very high in fried foods and refined grains and sugars and those kind of things and, you know, all the farsan that we eat, you know, the jevra and gantias and everything that's fried, that's not going to really help you, right? Okay. So now let's talk about, um, okay, so this is just another study. This study is showing that, you know, they're looking at people who had, uh, they're looking at almost 10,000 people washing them for 30 years and finding those people who had the highest cholesterol had more um, uh, dementia. But saturated fat, obesity, uh, cholesterol, diabetes, uh, all of these things, um, um, uh, all of these things contribute. And there is some evidence showing that uh, dairy milk also increases risk of uh, Parkinson's disease. There's some small studies, so it's not enough that we can really prove it right now, but it, there's some small studies implicating these things. Okay. Other health issues. Um, there is some reduction in thyroid disease. A lot of people are on thyroid medication when they get older. It's very, very common. So, you know, there's some lesser percentage if you're vegan. Um, it's not a huge lesser percentage, but there's some lesser percentage. Arthritis and you know, other things too. Let's, and cataracts in the eyes. So those are, those are all, those are all um, uh, decreased somewhat with more plant-based diets. Now, infectious diseases. This is very interesting. Uh, the flu virus starts in animals. In Asia, there are these huge factories that are breeding animals. Now in India, they are starting these kind of factories for milk, dairy, and eggs. And the animals are breeding viruses and diseases between each other. And the influenza virus starts in such places. And then from animals jumps into humans, and then it's spread across the world every year. And for most people, it's a mild disease, but for some people, they die from having influenza, and it's serious. And that generally comes from animals. Now, the avian flu and the swine flu that sometimes happens uh, is the same thing. All of these pigs or birds are transmitting the flu virus between each other and eventually have some kind of a virus that is very, very potent in humans, and it jumps into humans, and they start spreading it. And we're always waiting for the next disaster in terms of these diseases. So uh, that's all coming from animals originally. And SARS, Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome, um, that is... Uh, if people remember what that was, that really affected the Toronto community. And that was generated from pigs with coronavirus in China, where it came from. HIV comes from animals. People in 
uh, certain countries in Africa were hunting, um, you know, uh, monkeys, uh, chimpanzees, and they were killing them and using them as meat. Um, and some of their blood may have uh, gotten into humans. So, for example, when people are killing a monkey, they may cut themselves and the monkey's blood, you know, gets onto their cut, which then is a risk factor for transmission of simian immunodeficiency virus. So this SIV or simian immunodeficiency virus came into humans from this and then it transformed into different forms of HIV. There's different genetic variants of HIV and they uh, infected humans and they've caused devastation around the world. Um, this is originally from animals. Uh, Ebola is also from hunting these animals and also from um, people maybe killing bats in certain countries. That, so these harbor the Ebola virus and people killing these uh, you know, monkeys or uh, bats, sometimes they have an Ebola virus which spreads into the humans and then continues to spread. Okay, and then there's you know, all kinds of bad bacteria from the feces, the stool of animals that get into water. And then you have these different forms of E. coli. And that's one of the reasons why water is very dangerous in India. Human con humans contaminate the water with their stool, but same with a lot of animal contaminants, animal feces getting into water, also polluting the water and then causing, uh, um, you know, water uh, borne diseases. Okay. So that's also there. And in India, uh, a big thing in the past, but also worldwide, tuberculosis. People having raw milk around the world were transmitting tuberculosis from the cows into the milk and into humans, okay? And there's different forms of tuberculosis. Um, and, um, and some of them more pass through the milk. And that's why pasteurizing milk became such an important thing that uh, before that many people dying of tuberculosis. Okay. So those are some of the diseases that we like to prevent in terms of cancer, diabetes, heart disease, and infectious disease through a plant-based vegan diet. Okay. Now the question is now, how do you maximize your vegan diet? So what pointers can I give people to increase the health of their vegan diet? And how do we, um, even if you're not 100% vegan, even if you follow these principles, you can increase your health because the research shows that you don't have, even if you're not 100% vegan, but you are making these changes and you are moving in the direction of eating more healthy plant foods and less of the animal foods, you're going to have some incremental benefits. You're going to get definitely benefits along the way. So even if somebody's totally non-vegetarian and they start eating 50% vegetarian food, okay, well, that's great. They're going to have some environmental benefits. They're going to save a bunch of animals and they're going to also improve their health, okay? So for a lot of people, I can't convince them to become vegan right away, even though I would like to, right? I would like to tell people, hey, just become vegan. But it takes them time or they're, you know, people are very stubborn. Their habits are hard to change. You know, that's the way humans are. You know, humans are like that. We're not logical all the time. But I may be able to convince them that, listen, just give up half the animal products or 10% or 20%. Just start improving your diet, adding more of these foods. And if you increase more of these foods, then some of the animal foods will just naturally decrease from your diet and you're going to start getting healthier. This is the way we get people started, right? Then we want to continue that process, but at least we've done something and there's an improvement. You know, if everybody in North America ate 25% less meat, even if they didn't become vegan, but they ate 25% less meat, it would be a huge benefit to the environment. It would be, you know, we would save, literally, we would save, you know, in North America, we'd save 2.5 billion animals would be saved because we eat about 10 billion animals per year are killed, land animals, that is, are killed in North America. And you can save 2.5 billion of those and probably save even more fish, you know. So, um, so there's a lot to be gained, even by people becoming partially vegetarian. And once they get started, of course, we can then continue to improve. It's like you have a smoker who's smoking a pack a day. We want to get them to half a pack a day, even if they're not going to quit right away. When they get used to that, then we can push them a little bit farther. And one day they can quit, you know, but we're going to make it easier for them if we can. All right. So, okay. So how do we improve our vegan diet or our diet, whatever we are eating? Okay. 
And remember, these are permanent changes we make. It's not like a diet you do temporarily for health and then you go back to a standard diet. These are changes we want to make for the rest of our lives so that we can continue to experience the health benefits. So there are vegan food groups, okay? The main vegan food, vegan food groups are fruits, vegetables, whole grains, beans and legumes, and then some nuts, seeds, and healthy fats. Those make up the components. So what I tell people is, number one, you know, uh, eat a broad variety. There's uh, Jack Norris and Jeannie Messina, who I mentioned before, and they talk about the words, eat the rainbow, eat a diverse number of foods of all different kinds, all different colors, and you're going to get all the different vitamins and nutrients you need pretty much, okay? Like 99%. I'm going to talk about the one thing that we have to be careful of, okay? So eat the rainbow, all kinds of beans and lentils there. Remember that soya is a lentil. It's a pulse, okay? We use the word pulses very commonly in India. So um, definitely uh, all the beans and lentils, the whole grains. So there's all the whole grains there and fruits, vegetables. Now you can see in the bottom left corner, you see seeds and nuts. And in the bottom right corner, you see some healthy fats. We're going to talk about that. Now remember that humans evolved from herbivores. For, for many millions of years, our ancestors were primates and they started out by eating mainly fruit. Okay. We basically ate fruit all the time. And you know, once upon a time, our ancestors did live mostly in the trees, eventually coming down on the ground, but continuing to eat a plant-based diet. Now, over the last maybe uh, two, three hundred thousand years, you know, people started forming uh, different humanoid groups, moving around the world outside of Africa. Everybody started out in Africa, going to places where they didn't have all the plant foods, and then started to eat some meat. So, like our ancestors, I see from. Uh, um, one of our uh, panelists saying that uh, one of our one of our audience saying that uh, yes, our ancestors were vegan. Yay! So it's true they were vegan. They were vegan for millions of years, but then over the last like couple of hundred thousand years, whatever it is, people did start eating meat and animal products as well. But our biology, our digestive system, is let's say ninety nine percent unchanged. Okay. It's going to be 99. There's a couple of small genetic things that might have changed, not for everybody, but um, you know we are still biologically pretty much identical to herbivores. Okay, um, and you can see this from a number of things. Our oral cavity. Now let's look at an omnivore. A pig is an omnivore. A rat is an omnivore. Uh, a dog is an omnivore. Okay. A bear is an omnivore. Okay. Their mouth is much bigger. It can open very wide. Okay. Their teeth and jaws move like hinges. They don't move side to side, uh, back and forth, side to side. They can't do those motions for grinding plants. They can't do that. But herbivores can do that. Okay. Herbivores means that they, you know, animals who eat like more than 95 or 99%, they primarily plant based foods, and it can exist exclusively on plant based foods. So, there are examples of some herbivores that sometimes might eat an animal product. You know, some deer, sometimes they actually uh, eat a small bird, you know, very tiny, like baby bird or an egg. You know, sometimes they'll do that. Chimpanzees or monkeys sometimes eat some animal foods. But if they don't get animal foods for their entire life, they're completely fine and there's no need for them. Okay. And even if animal foods are available, they continue to eat the plant foods. That's what they predominantly eat. So that's what a herbivore is. And sometimes they might eat an animal food, but it's unnecessary. Okay. It just may happen sometimes. Uh, they have these amylase enzymes that digest starches, which most omnivores don't have. Okay. Uh, they have a low level of acid in their digestive tract. They sweat. A dog or a pig, they don't sweat, they pant. They go, <laughs> right? They stick out their tongue and they pant. Um, oops. Uh-oh. What's going on here? All right. Sorry about that, guys. Uh, oh, there we go. All right. So hopefully that's okay. Um, you know, and there's all kinds of other, um, they can get cholesterol. Herbivores can get high cholesterol, but omnivores, like a dog, can never get high cholesterol. They, um, or pigs, they can never get high cholesterol. They can eat all the meat they want. Their cholesterol won't go up. You know? So there's all kinds of biochemical things as well that are different for them. And they never get heart disease from eating meat. Okay. All right. Okay. 
So um, I give an example where when I was in India once, I saw a small dog run, jump, and catch a pigeon. And this uh, dog, this small little dog, ate the entire pigeon. You know, this whole pigeon uh, swallowed this whole pigeon pretty much and bit off a wing. You know, and I seen another small dog once eating the dead body of another dog, you know, that's just in the street like that. Okay. As a human, if you can do that, if you can just go up to a dead animal and start eating it, you know, or if you could just go to a uh, pigeon and quickly catch it and swallow a whole pigeon, then you can consider yourself to be an omnivore. But if you need tools to help catch that animal, and then cut that animal up quickly and only select certain body parts. And then you have to cook them so that you, you can eat them safely without getting sick. Then you're not an omnivore. Then we are a technivore. That's a, coin, a term that I've coined that we've developed technology to be able to eat these things. But naturally, just like that, we can't do it. In the same way, if you know, the human is the only animal that drinks the milk of another animal on a regular basis. And the way we get it, we can't just go up to a cow or a goat and start sucking on that cow or goat. That doesn't work. We evolved all kinds of procedures and technologies over you know, thousands of years, even milking the cow by hand. That's not a natural thing. That's something that we had to learn how to do it. And we had to develop you know, pots and pans and all kinds of materials to catch that milk, store that milk, boil that milk so we don't get diabetes. Uh, sorry, tuberculosis, and then drink that milk and refrigeration and all kinds of things like that. So those are all things that are developed um, from our technologies. Okay. Now, vegan nutrition. Okay. Uh, continued. Okay. So uh, we are not omnivores. We are pretty much designed as herbivores. Okay. Now, some people in the world have developed the ability to digest milk at a later age. Most of the world has not. Most people of the world are lactose intolerant. Babies have lactose. They can dissolve, digest lactose, but most people are lactose intolerant. That some people, like say Europeans more, and maybe some Indians, have developed the ability to keep this enzyme later in their life. And so, you know, that's an example of a biochemical change that has happened over thousands of years. But again, uh, we are able to digest the lactose, but that doesn't mean that the milk is always good for us because we do get some uh, uh, increased cancers and heart disease and diabetes from the dairy products. Okay. So let's talk about protein. This is a very important topic. Now, some people say, oh, you know, um, they make fun of the fact that meat eaters don't know where we get our protein from. Okay. Um, that it becomes a joke. Somebody keeps asking us, oh, you know, where you get your protein? And we're sick of that question. But it is a somewhat important question because I also see people who are vegan and vegetarian who don't know how to get their protein. And they're having very low protein. And in India, a lot of times I observe somebody saying, oh, this guy is so athletic and he's got a lot of muscles. He must be non-veg. Okay. And why are people saying that? Why? I'm from a Gujarati background. And I see a lot of my friends and families eating a very low protein diet. And then, yeah, maybe they don't grow as big or as tall, or they don't have as much, you know, they're not as what we call sporty. You know, they say the word sporty in India. They're not so sporty, or they're not as strong as some of their non-vegetarian friends. Why is that? When I look at the Gujarati diet, they have a very, very small consumption of lentils and beans. Uh, compared to, let's say, Punjabi food. In Punjabi, in Punjabi food, when you eat rajma, when you eat uh, chickpeas, I mean, chole, people eat a whole big plate and then they take another plate. But when you have Gujaratis, they have just a small amount of chana and they make it into kind of like a soup. It's mostly liquid and a little bit of black chana. You know? Or the dal is 95% water, 90% water, and 10% lentils compared to, let's see, in Punjabi vegetarian food, they'll have a thick, thick dal and a lot of it, you know? So we have to learn how to eat proper protein. Now, if you have Gujarati people or anybody in India who's getting half of their protein because they're drinking a glass of milk in the morning and a glass of milk in the daytime, and they're having yogurt maybe three times a day, that's getting 50% of their protein through dairy products. 
now they stop the dairy products and they become vegan, they're going to cut their protein even lower. Okay. So that's not good. Okay. Because I see too many people doing like this. Okay. Even the vegetarians need to increase their protein, but we want to do it from plant-based foods. Okay. We want to do it from plant-based foods. That way we're going to have less diseases. We're going to also be more environmental. We're going to save animals, right? So we have to pay attention for, uh, for where we're going to get our protein. And Dr. Rupa made such a beautiful book. I see, uh, I see her uh, little post there, Protein for Gujarati. <laughs> yes, and for everybody. Okay, this is not just Gujaratis, but I see it more in Gujaratis because I'm Gujarati and I'm seeing my family more, right? But other people can have the same problem too. So now um, uh, she wrote a beautiful book about plant-based milks, okay? Uh, uh, Rupa Ben wrote a beautiful book. And so I encourage everybody to take a look at this book. And the most important plant-based milk is soya milk, okay? Because we showed that soya is really good for you. There's less prostate cancer, less breast cancer. It also lowers your cholesterol. It increases your bone strength. There's so many good things, you know? So that way, it, um, you know, soya milk has the highest amount of protein. So that's what we really want to focus on compared to the other types of uh, plant-based milks, which don't have protein. So if you're taking something away from your diet, if you're taking milk out of your diet, then you must put something else in its place that's going to have the same protein and even a better protein. So what we want to encourage people in India is we want to increase the beans and lentils that they eat. Eat the way Punjabi food is made, that amount of rajma, dal, and beans. Remember to make it low fat because I know Punjabi food. I live in Canada. We have mostly Punjabis here in terms of the Indian people. I eat lots of Punjabi food and I know people put too much oil. Okay. Too much oil, but um, you know, so we want to, we want to have low fat, but a lot of the beans and lentils, thick dal, sprouted lentils. One well, now one good thing about Gujaratis is they sprout their mung beans. I think other people may be doing it in India too. I'm not sure, but we have sprouted mung beans. And we can sprout a whole bunch of mung beans. And we can have a, we, we, we do a tarka, vagar. You know, we, uh, we uh, saute them with some Indian spices a little bit. And then we can eat a big bowl, right? And I put lemon juice and some spices and I eat it with some kakra. You know, if you guys know what kakra are. You know, you can eat the sprouted mug every day, a big bowl of that. And that's going to give you some good protein. But remember, we want a broad array, uh, variety of foods, not just mung beans or one thing, but variety. Now, quinoa, I don't know if you can get quinoa in India, but it has 10% of a high quality protein. Hemp seeds, I don't know how, you, how much you can get hemp in India, but you can have, um, you can have hemp seeds uh, that we make hemp protein powders and other things like that that are very, very healthy as well, very high quality protein. Now, somebody has asked, is it safe for men? Is soya safe for men? That's a very good question. Um, good. And I see that quinoa is easily available in India. That's great. Okay. So now there is, um, the soy proteins, you know, you have the Nutrella, the, those little soy nuggets that you have in India. People had that for a long time. Those are good. And they, they're not so great in their taste, but now there's new ones coming that are better taste. And I want everybody to look up something called good dot. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Um, and, uh, okay. Um, good dot, G O O D D O T good dot. Okay. And so just write that down in the chat there. Good dot dot I N I think is the website and they're making the first veggie meats in India. There's soy milk, uh, that you can get, you know, but I always tell people the unsweetened soy milk, not the sugary stuff, tempeh, and then a the whole grains. When you're eating whole grains, the whole wheat and so many different ancient grains in India, so many different grains, um, you know, there's javar and then there's oats and there's so many different things and rice, we should eat rice. You know, they all have 10% protein. So even those provide some protein. But remember that the champions of protein are the pulses, okay? Um, so that's what we want to make sure we eat more of. And, and soy, uh, soy milk is also a pulse. It's like a, it's like a dal essentially, but it's a white colored dal, okay? We need about 0 0.8 grams of protein per kilogram per day. That's what 90, 95% of people need. Okay. Even if you're exercising and doing stuff, 0 0.8 grams per kilogram is good for you. So if you weigh 50 kilograms, you need 40 grams of protein. If you weigh 70 kilograms, you know, you need about, uh, let's say 
54 grams of protein, roughly, you know? And you can go a little bit higher than that. You can go one gram per kilogram. Okay, if you weigh 60 kilograms or 70 kilograms, get 70, kilogram, 70 grams of protein per day. Now, some people in North America and other places are obsessed with protein. They eat too much protein. They're eating two and three grams per day. That's too much. Most vegetarians don't eat that much, especially in India. I have never seen people eat that much protein. But I see people having low protein diets, and that's not good, as I mentioned. Okay, There's a number of complications in terms of less muscle strength, less bone strength, and people may be feeling more weak and other things. You have to have enough protein. So be careful about getting too much and don't get too little either. There is all protein is a complete protein. They used to say that you have to, to, um, uh, you have to complement your proteins. You have to have some grains and some pulses to get a complete protein, but that's not true. Every food has a complete protein, but there's a slightly lower amount of lysine. Lysine is one of the essential amino acids. It's slightly lower in the grains. It's still present. So even if people only had grains and they never had pulses, they're still going to get protein. They're still going to grow and do well, you know, in most cases. But you can have a more advantage if you're eating more pulses as well. So mix up those proteins, okay? Get a lot of pulses as well as the whole grains. Elderly people, pregnant women, lactating women, growing children, they need to have uh, more protein. Now I see some, uh, I see some comments here. Uh, okay, poor people cannot afford pulses. That's true. You know, there is a shortage of pulses. Now, this is a, a big issue in India and worldwide that we are not able to grow enough food for everybody. And because there is, uh, India is not self-sufficient in the growth of pulses, it's the largest importer in the world of pulses, okay? And Canada is the second largest grower of pulses after India, and India is the biggest um, importer from Canada of pulses. So there's a lot of things here for food security. You know, India has a 1.3 billion population. It's huge. When I was a child, it was 800 million people in India, 700 million people when I was a kid. You know, it's nearly doubled the population. If population growth still continues, eventually there'll be 2 billion people. No matter what we grow on the planet, we're going to have shortages and when the world population increases. And that's one of the main reasons that it's difficult to afford. Now we can do things temporarily to increase the production of pulses. However, uh, even if we increase production, but then the population doubles again, we're still gonna have a problem, right? So there are multiple problems and uh, lots of things about human uh, demographics and behaviors and education level and all these things are gonna play a very big role in trying to have food security and uh, you know solve problems for poverty and environment and all these kind of things, okay? But uh, we can increase the production of pulses and a lot of the land, a lot of the soya that is, um, you know, that is, uh, you know, that is fed to animals. Instead, we can make soy products and soy milk for human consumption and we're going to help, you know, the you know, protein needs for people, right? Uh, I see a uh, move the labor from beer slash leather to agrarian employment can solve, you know, def definitely. So especially animal-based foods. Animal-based foods are, you know, consume a lot of the world's resources, you know, and so moving away from animal foods can provide more food, food for humans. Now, India overall is a low uh, percentage of animal foods, even with the people who are eating meat, etc. cetera. Um, so um, there is definitely some improvement we can make, but um, population, you know, uh, and education and things like that are still going to be very important. Okay, let's move on. Now, the one thing that vegans have to be careful about is vitamin B12. Okay, let's talk about vitamin B12. So vitamin B12 comes from the soil originally. Bacteria are the only organisms that make vitamin B12. All right, that's the only organism that makes B12. So in when we were animals uh, that were herbivores living in the jungle, okay, we used to mostly live around the trees and everything, but a lot of the things we ate may have fallen to the ground or you have bacteria growing on them even on the tree and we have to come down, we have to drink water from any source that we get. We drink it from the river or there could be a pond or there could be a lake and we drink directly from that and we're always getting small amounts of B12 from the different bacteria. 
Now we completely drink filtered water. We even put some, you know, water purification in the municipal water. So we're getting rid of all of the bacteria. And therefore, there's no B12 in our water. And even all of our vegetables, when we eat them or what we do, we wash them first. So we're not eating any soil or any of those kind of things, okay? Also, people used to, uh, the, the feces, you know, the poop, that people make is also has a lot of B12. And so in the jungle, in the old days, you get, you go down, you people are, you know, animals are pooping. Pooping is always mixed with the soil. And then people go down, you know, and get some food that might have some contamination from the feces as well. And they're getting more B12 like that as well. So, you know, we don't recommend that anymore. The human poop has become very dangerous compared to those times because now there's so many people who are passing around diseases and there's so many things going around that you know, we can't do that. But what we need to do is we still have to get that B12. And it's very important. A lot of people neglect it. They feel fine. But over, you know, 30 years, 40 years, they increase the risk of cancer. They increase the risk of heart disease by having low B12 levels. And sometimes they feel a little bit less energy. Sometimes they feel a little bit weaker. You know, that may be also a B12 related problem. Okay. So what we like to do is we like to eat foods. In North America, we drink soy milk a lot. And in the soy milk, they're putting B12 the same amount as what is um, uh, um, the same amount of what is contained in milk. Okay. So, you know, but still for some people, they have such variation. Like some people have glasses, some people nearsighted, some people farsighted, you know, that way people also have the similar differences in their B12 absorption. So some people uh, don't absorb B12 very well. And what I recommend for people who are vegan or even vegetarian and even meat eaters, I tell the same thing to meat eaters, every couple of years, check your B12. And then you can take a supplement if you need it. Okay. Um, somebody made a uh, comment there. Um, Samarjit said, that I'm a B12 excess being vegan and my wife is a voracious non-vegetarian, yet B12 is deficient. And that's very common. I have a lot of people in my family practice, when I was doing family practice, they were fully carnivore people. They eat a lot of meat and eggs and everything like that, but their B12 was low. I also met some people who uh, are vegans and they don't take any extra B12, but their B12 is normal. Okay. I've seen both sides. However, if you take the average, vegans have lower B12. There are more vegans with low B12. So people have different absorptions, but people are also having lower amounts, okay, if they're, if they're vegan. Because the animals are still consuming B12, and therefore it's in the meat, dairy, and the eggs, okay? Um, but the humans are washing and filtering their foods, so we may not get it from plants. Now, interestingly, all of the animals that grow up in factory farms and for North Americans and most Europeans and even in India, most of the animals are fed grains and they're fed all these things. Those things don't have B12 anymore. So what they do in North America and everywhere else is they add B12 into the feed of the animals. They get artificial B12, they put it into the feed and then it goes from there, the, the, the plant food, the artificial B12 goes into their um, meat, dairy and eggs. So when they're eating an egg, they think they're getting B12 from the chicken, but really even the chicken is just given a supplement and that's why it's in the egg. So that's very interesting as well. So uh, can we get B12 from fresh wheat, grass juice and homemade, homemade pickles? No, okay? It's not a reliable source of B12. We've got to take it from fortified foods, but especially once a week we should take, let's say maybe 1,000 uh, micrograms once or twice a week, about you know 500 to a 2,000 once or twice a week. We take it just once a week. You don't have to take it every day. Every day is not necessary. But once or twice a week, take a supplement. And then once a year, check your blood test for B12. And if it's okay, then fine. But if it's not okay, then increase a little bit and then you know, you'll be fine after some time. Check it again in a few months, okay? Once it's normal every year for two or three years, then you can check every two years as long as you're continuing your same uh, usage of B12 vitamin. Okay. And what I do is I just take my vitamin B12 once a week. And for me, that's enough. And I drink soy milk that has B12 in it. And my B12 is perfect. You don't have to do too much. Now, India B12 is very expensive, but uh, a friend of mine, um, 
uh, his name is Samir Shah. Actually, he's a good friend. He is, his company is going to bring out India's cheapest B12, okay? That's going to happen very soon, okay? In the next year or so, we're going to get it into the market, okay? And so we'll see how to do that, okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to get a, a good B12 into the market. So that's very important, okay? So, all right. Now, especially be careful if somebody's pregnant or breastfeeding and for children because the brain development requires some B12, okay? So we want to make sure especially that, um, um, you know, uh, we want to make sure that uh, it's, it's, uh, it's there, okay? And for some reason, B12, everything's cheap in India in terms of medications, except for vitamins are expensive. I don't know why, but we're going to have a cheap B12 soon, okay? So I was in Mexico. I was also showing there that, you know, even in Mexico, even if you have, a, you know, it take a thousand microgram tablet and you break it into one quarter, okay? And three or four times a week, you take a small quarter of a tablet and you break it and you mix it in the food of the family and everybody's getting a little bit of B12, you know, um, every, um, uh, you know, three or four times a week, we're going to be okay. And you do not need injections. If people have low B12, you do not need injections. Some people think you do. But in most cases, all you have to do is take the the B12, supplement the B12, and your B12 will become normal. The injections are only needed in very few people, but I know doctors don't understand it and they love to give injections to everybody. We don't need that. Just oral supplementation is plenty, okay? So if you're low in B12, take 1,000 microgram tablet and you take that maybe three or four times a week, okay? For maybe two or three months and three months, let's say. Check your blood test and you're probably gonna be fine by that time, okay? Okay. Now, uh, there's a special vegetarian uh, supplement that they have in the UK. I'm just going to mention it briefly here because, the, you know, maybe you like that. We'll bring, make something like this in India one day, okay? Um, okay, so now calcium and iron, okay? Um, what we like to do is uh, make sure that uh, you just use Google, okay? Google is your friend. Where do you get, just go Google vegan calcium and iron, and you're going to see great websites with lots of information. So um, there'll be legumes, um, uh, have great iron and calcium, all the pulses, okay? Uh, soy milk can sometimes be made fortified with calcium. The dark green, oops, uh, dark green uh, leafy vegetables. So broccoli, I don't know if you get so much broccoli in India, I think you get it, and kale. Does anybody know if you get kale in India? Kale is a superfood. It's amazing because it has broccoli and kale both have vitamin C as well as iron and calcium at the same time, okay? At the same time you have that. Um, and so that vitamin C helps the absorption of, helps the, absorption of the um, calcium and iron, okay? Um, other things, I think the, the mustard greens and collard greens and bok choy and some of those things, they have a lot of iron and calcium and you can absorb it. Now, some things like spinach, spinach has a lot of iron, but it's stuck because of the oxalate that's in the spinach. So you can't really absorb it from the spinach. So look and see which of the green vegetables, um, you can use Google, okay, give you the best absorption of iron. Okay, so that's very important. So kale is a great, great one, but there's other ones that are very typically used in India, very common Indian ones, and some of them are very good, okay, and, and better than spinach. So just look that up and see which one is available, see which one is affordable, and make sure that people in your family are eating those, okay? Now, molasses is made out of sugar cane. It's the dark stuff taken out of sugar cane, um, and, and that uh, has a concentration of iron. Cream of wheat or whole grains. Whole grains generally have some iron and calcium. Raisins, nuts, seeds, they have iron and calcium. Now, if you eat at the same time fruits and vegetables that are red and orange, so like, you know, capsicum, you know, you get capsicum and you get um, uh, all kinds of, you know, different pumpkin, uh, oranges, tomatoes, all of these things, everything, just look up vitamin C in vegetables. You'll see all kinds of things that have vitamin C. So if you have vitamin C foods at the same time as calcium foods, you absorb a lot more, okay? And I see that you get kale in India, so I, I'm going to look for that. And it's called gukvi, so I'm going to look for this kale in India and see if I can find it myself. What's the price like? Is it very expensive? Um, and is it 
newly available in uh, called Kakfiyas Molasses, okay. Um, and is it newly available? Is kale newly available in India or is it there for a long time? Can somebody tell me about that? Is that something new in India? And you can tell me if it's expensive or not. You can just put that there maybe. Um, newly available. So, so kale sounds like something new and it's expensive. Okay. Well, when people start growing it more and more and more, then it's going to get more common. So right now it's expensive. Okay. So right now it's not the most important source in India because it's too expensive, but eventually it's going to get cheap if people start buying it. Okay. And then people will grow it more and then the price will come down. Now, some people, if they're vegan and they're taking all the good iron foods and their iron is still low, they feel very upset that I'm eating a natural diet and my iron is still low. How come, you know? And the truth is that, you know, that um, we, we can't always, um, you know, you can't always uh, have a perfect iron. Some people just are bad at absorbing iron. So some people need to take supplementation. Now, calcium, okay. Calcium, there's different requirements according, you know, to different sources. In the UK, they, they are pretty good. And they say, you know, for most adults, you need 700 milligrams per day. For some people, like your pregnancy or breastfeeding or certain stages of life, you're very old or you're a growing kid, you may need like 1,000 or 1,200 micrograms of calcium per day. The US recommendations are generally higher. They recommend, you know, uh, 1,200 milligrams per day for adults or something like that. So it's hard to know where exactly it is. But we know that if you go lower than 700, that you get weaker bones, okay? So that's very important. Okay, we know that if you go lower than 700. So one of the things that we wanna do is if people are substituting, if they're getting rid of milk from their diet, we want to put in a soy milk that has the same amount of calcium. And if people are drinking two glasses of calcium per day, that's gonna be like you know 500 uh, milligrams, 600 milligrams. And then the other foods that they eat, that will like whole grains and pulses and everything will will give them another two three four hundred and they're going to be fine okay so we want to make sure that we are um, getting enough calcium for sure because if we don't we will have weak bones and it's shown that vegans who are not getting enough calcium had greater amount of broken bones when they got older especially things like hip fracture and spinal fractures but if they were eating enough calcium then they were fine okay no problem now, other factors that increase bone strength is protein intake, but also having lots of fruits and vegetables and stuff like that. That's also very good. And we talked about the vitamin C foods, okay? We'll show that a little bit more, just some pictures of vitamin C foods, okay? Okay, fracture risk. We talked about soya milk. Soya also, even just plain old soya, increases people's bone strength better than milk. But we want to take soya that has calcium added. Okay, that's very important. Uh, fruits and vegetables and legumes and pulses and exercise. Exercise and walking and doing exercise is very important for um, bone strength in the future. And vitamin D, okay? Now, there's a lot of people that are worried about vitamin D in India. So it's getting controversial. We don't have great evidence that taking vitamin D definitely increases your bone strength. And people have low levels of vitamin D, but we don't always know what that uh, really means for human health. One minute, Tushar. Someone wants to see previous slide again. Oh, previous slide? Okay. This one over here? Okay. Uh, it's just yeah. showing that vegetables, legumes, pulses, exercise are very good. Soy milk is very, very good. Not just with added calcium, but soya itself. One before that? Okay. This here? Mm. Which okay. means see, yeah. Now, this is a, a, a little bit of a random picture that I put. I think most of these vegetables have vitamin C, but maybe the banana doesn't have vitamin C. Maybe the, you know, but if you look up, if you Google, um, if you Google the um, vitamin, um, uh, vitamin uh, C uh, sources, you'll see lots of vegetables and everything like that that have vitamin C. Things like amla have lots of vitamin C. You don't have to eat a whole amla, but eating a little bit of amla, tiny bit of amla with your food, or putting it in your food, if you do that, can increase the vitamin C. If squeezing a lemon may not be enough vitamin C because you're not eating enough, just having a little bit of lemon in your food. You need to have a little bit more than that. So using a lot of lemon, uh, limes, or um, you know, nimbu, however you want to call it. You know, but just look at the, the, all the different fruits and vegetables that have vitamin C, and there's many of them, okay? And you mix that when you're eating pulses and whole grains. You also want to eat a lot of these, okay? Okay, so vitamin D3, yeah, somebody's saying that they have 
um, um, uh, low uh, vitamin D. Um, Rupa, Ben, you put sunshine and liver. I don't think liver is a good way to get vitamin D because there's so, you know, it's, it's not vegetarian and there's so many toxins in liver, right? Sunshine is very good. Now, you know, in India, we have this tradition that people generally cover up their bodies. We, we don't wear a lot of t-shirts and shorts and all those kind of things, you know, compared to people, if you go to Brazil, people love to go to the beach and hang out, you know, and they, you know, and they uh, can wear their bathing suit, you know, they're getting a lot more vitamin C, but we are very, very covered up in India. And nowadays people are spending most of their time indoors. Okay. Uh, I see some nice comments here, guava and vitamin C. Um, and uh, uh, is it okay to consume soy milk every day? And I'm going to get to that. I'm going to have some slides about that as well. Okay. Um, so we don't get enough sunshine. Now, if you're getting sunshine all the time on your face, you're going to get aging, photo aging more quickly, you know, but um, you know, we want some exposure averaged over our body would be ideal. You know, in India, that is difficult though. Like where do I go in Mumbai to get sunlight, you know, uh, like, uh, and, and do any kind of like walk around in shorts and a, and a, and a bunion and get, and get some vitamin D. It's a little bit difficult in Mumbai, the terrace. Yeah. Okay. So we can do that in the terrace, you know, but even for women in India, it's difficult. They, they like to stay very covered up. So it's a little bit challenging. Okay. But, uh, and, and a lot of times even women, you know, even if they're not working, they don't go out a lot, you know, going and walking around in India is, it can be tough depending on where you live. Um, but it's good to get some more sunlight. Okay, spread over our body, not just all the time, only on our face and our hands, and then they get uh, damaged from the sun over time. Um, but also vitamin D3. So we're going to get some vitamin, vegan vitamin D3 is going to get cheaper and cheaper because we want D number three. D2 is not as good as D3. Um, and we want to get like, you know, a, a thousand units or 5,000 units if you want to, but, you know, and start taking more vitamin D. You, now it's optional. We don't have proof that taking more vitamin D3 is necessarily going to improve your health in the long run. We don't know that. You know, so having low D3, we don't really know what the consequence is. We don't have good medical evidence. It's not like cholesterol or blood sugar, where we show that if you have high cholesterol, high blood sugar, it really is impacting us in terms of heart disease and other things. We don't have that kind of information for low D3. Some experts sit around the table and, and they write down, we think, oh, D3 should be like from here to here. But, you know, we have very limited science to base this on and we have very limited science to show whether vitamin D supplementation really helps you. So it's an optional thing. We can think about it. We don't have enough information right now. It's a gray area. It's a definitely a gray area where we don't have enough information. People are very much panicking over vitamin D3, but we don't have enough information as to really um, what does a low level mean? Is it really a disadvantage? Um, so it's something that we have to, you know, um, learn more about still. Okay. Um, uh, Dr. Ruba put sunshine and soil connection. What's the soil connection that you're talking about? Um, uh, Rupa Ben, what are you talking about there? Oh, B12. Okay. Yeah. So definitely, you know, we want to be connected to the sun. We want to be connected to the, to the soil. And that's natural for us to be connected to the soil and the sun. So these things were never a problem for us. You know, uh, back in the days when we lived in the, you know, as, as kind of in the forest and before, you know, early civilizations and pre-civilization, we never had a problem with these nutrients probably, but it's more like with modern life, we have a problem with these and that's why we have to supplement. But so to D3 is not as important as B12. B12 is more important. D3, let's think about it and let's keep learning more. Okay. But if you want to, but now for some people like me, I'm a very dark skinned person and I don't live in India. I live in Canada and Canada half the year is pretty dark and cold and we don't get much sunlight at that time. And when we go outside, we have to cover up because it's so cold. We have to wear everything. So, and, and uh, we don't even get much sunlight at that time anyways. So for dark people living in the Northern areas, maybe they need more D3. Um, maybe some old people who are always inside, uh, who are always indoors and they never get outside. 
you know, maybe those guys need some D3. But for the rest of us, we don't exactly know if there's a benefit or a harm. So Dr. Rupa is asking, what's the temperature right now? Uh, I think the temperature, let me just check my phone. At night, it, was, it went to zero. We had uh, frost, you know. And right oh. now it is six degrees Celsius uh, in Toronto right now. It's six degrees. So it's a very sunny day. It's beautiful outside. But it's a little bit chilly now. It's getting closer and closer to winter. Okay. All right. So remember, you can also get vitamin D3. That is vegan. Okay. Now let's talk about iodine. Uh, in Canada, we get iodine in our salt. Okay. In the UK, they put iodine in the milk. So those people who become vegan have to have another source of iodine. And in India, I don't know the answer. Does anybody know where people get iodine in India? Is it salt that's usually iodized in India? Probably it's going to be salt. Right. Okay. So having, we should not eat a lot of salt. We should not eat a lot of salt, but that little bit of salt, you know, does give us some of the iodine that we need. We don't need that much. Um, I'm not exactly sure how much salt you need to tell you the truth, but you know, that little bit of salt that we find that we, that we eat is, is um, gonna, should be iodized. Okay. Now for Indian people, we like to eat a lot of sweets. We like to eat a lot of sweets. We like our fried food. We like our Chievra and Gantia and chips and kurkure and everything like that. We love that stuff. It's junk food. We love Maggi noodles. It's full of oil. It's full of salt and it's full of refined carbohydrates. Now there are some Maggi now that's whole grain, I think, but it still has a lot of salt and some saturated fats in that, in that Maggi noodles. Okay. So, we have to be very careful about this. Remember that we are trying to eat a whole food plant-based diet. So I'm going to ask somebody, is orange juice a good food or a bad food? Tell me, type it in there. Is orange juice good? Uh, if we have orange juice, nice Mosambi juice, is it good for you or, or not, not good for you? All right, Gavit is saying it's bad. It's bad. That's right. It is not a whole food. You should eat an orange. That's right, Dr. Rupa. You should eat the orange. But if you're eating a... Um, if you're eating a... Um, uh, how do you call it? Uh, orange juice, you're getting mostly sugar, but all the fiber and all the other things are gone. They're filtered out and you're getting the sugar from about five or six oranges. Now, what about an orange smoothie? So if you make a smoothie and you put the whole orange inside your smoothie, you put the whole orange and you blend it up, then you're eating the whole food. So the smoothie is not bad. No, the smoothie is okay. Because if you put a smoothie and you put some soy milk and you put one orange and you put a little bit of uh, let's say almond butter or peanut butter, you put some, and peanuts, by the way, are a good food. Okay. They have, they have a lot of oil, but they're still good for you if they're not fried. Okay. So you put, um, uh, you, and you put some fruit inside your smoothie. That's not so bad. Okay. That is good because you're just having one orange and you're eating all of the fiber from the orange. Okay. Not just the juice. Okay. And concentrating the juice from a whole bunch of oranges and then taking only the sugar and subtracting the, the pulp and all the other healthy components. So smoothies are different than juices. And once in a while, if you have a juice, okay, fine. But, you know, even for fruit, if somebody's diabetic and you have very sensitive diabetes, be careful of the sweet fruits as well. Focus more on the fresh vegetables. Okay. Okay. All right. So supplements, do we need to get a lot of supplements? I think no. The only supplement that we really, really need is we need to take our vitamin B12. And after that, have lots of broad range of foods, have pulses, have whole grains. Remember, white flour, white roti, white rice, white bread is not good. Okay, we're going to have a slide on that again. Okay, so eat whole foods, the whole fr fruit, not the juice only. Okay, now some people think that gluten is bad. And some people say that soy is bad. They're afraid of it. I got those questions. Is it okay for men to eat soy? And is it okay to eat soy every day? Okay. That's what they're asking. Okay. Now, in, in Canada, we have this gluten-free craze. It's a big craze that, oh, you have to eat gluten-free. These are all kind of modern superstitions. Okay. Gluten is found in many different types of grain. There's also grains that do not have gluten, but there's many that do. Okay. Gluten, uh, is fine in whole grains. If you're eating whole grains, they are very good for you. If you're eating refined grains, like I said, white rice, you know, even that there's no gluten in rice, but if it's white rice, it's not good for you. White noodles, white pasta, uh, white rotis. When you're eating the, um, uh, the crust of any of these samosas and all that stuff, it's white flour, you know, 
plus it's fried. That's not good for you, okay? The whole grain. So when we eat at our house, uh, when my mom makes roti, she mixes different things. Somebody mentioned amaranth, you know? Amaranth and um, sorghum and all these ancient grains are also very good for us. They consider it as a poor man's food, but it's actually very good for us as well, eating the whole grain, okay? So eat lots of this. We make our roti flour. We mix different grains. We put in a bit of soy flour, but we also have a bit of... Uh, amaranth and whole grain uh, wheat and a few other things. My mom mixes three, four different kinds of things together. And that's great. You're getting the, the nutrition from so many different sources. Okay. So whole grains are good. And remember, we should eat brown rice, brown rice, white rice, not white rice, but brown rice is very good for us. Okay. That's what we need to do. And soy is very safe. You can eat soy every day. There's no single medical study showing that soy has a disadvantage for men and their testosterone levels, their sperm counts, their body mass index. There's no evidence that it affects puberty in a negative way. And it doesn't, there's no evidence that it causes breast problems in women. Soy is safe. So you can have, you know, if you're having like two or three servings of soy per day, great protein. And in the long run, it protects us from breast cancer, prostate cancer. It increases the strength of our bones. It reduces our cholesterol. It is truly a superfood. But that's why the meat and dairy industry, they put everything everywhere on the internet all the time to try and criticize soy and make people afraid of soy. They, they, they pay all of these organizations to say, oh, you're going to get soy. If you eat soy, you're going to get man boobs or moves, right? This is, uh, Samarjit is asking about this. There's not true at all, but it's everywhere on the internet. And the meat and dairy industry pay these different websites and they pay the different people in these different websites, nutrition, create this fear. And even doctors then become afraid, even though there's no medical evidence, we don't read everything. We don't know the medical evidence about everything. So we also get worried about it. But the evidence is very clear that there's no harm shown and that there is... A benefit of prostate cancer. You know, it's the worst thing for getting moobs is having your uh, prostate cancer. And then they have to give you hormonal therapy and, or they have to give hormonal therapy that stops testosterone production to prevent recurrence of the, you know, of the cancer. Now, one thing that's very interesting is they always worry about, um, um, we always worry about, uh, worry about, um, uh, soy, right? We always worry about soy, but actually uh, animal foods contain estrogen. So soy foods contain isoflavones and they have a tiny, 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 tiny estrogen effect like that, but they also then have a bigger effect that blocks estrogen. So they change the way estrogen works in the body, and, but they have a tiny estrogen effect, but they also have estrogen blocking effects. So what they do is they moderate, modulate the effects of estrogen in the body. We call them selective estrogen um, receptor modifiers, okay? That's the medical way that you would describe uh, isoflavone in soy food. But animal foods contain direct estrogen. So if you eat the body of a female animal, if there's a female chicken or a female fish or a female cow or uh, lamb or something like that, they have estrogen. They have full estrogen that when we eat, we get that estrogen in our body and it has a full estrogen effect. So I see man boobs all the time, but I see them in meat eaters. I don't see them in vegans, okay? And milk, it has estrogen because the cow, when the cow is lactating, she or any animal has a lot of estrogen at that time. That estrogen is coming out into the milk and we're eating animal estrogen, which has a 100% effect in, uh, in humans. And eggs are developed in the ovary of a chicken and the chickens are female and it absorbs the estrogen in the body of the, uh, of the chicken and eggs actually have estrogen. So you never see this on the internet. It's the reason is that it's the meat and dairy industry that are doing all of these things about soy, but nobody's coming out and saying that they have estrogen in those animal foods, all right? Now, GMO soy, now, why is everybody afraid of GMO soy compared to all the other GMO foods? GMO soy is not better or worse than any other GMO product. And most of our milk and dairy and eggs and animals are also bred 
and are genetically modified. And they are always fed genetically modified food as well. One of the worst problems is that GMO food has more pesticides, right? And so we have to, um, um, so we have to, uh, what's something, there's another question here. So, so we have to, you know, be careful about, you know, the pesticide use and things like that, but it's no worse than any other food and the pesticides in any other food. The research on soy is done with regular soy in the marketplace in those Asian studies. So those were not organic soys that showed the benefit. Organic soy may have an increased benefit, but regular soy still has a benefit. But luckily, most of the soy that is going to be coming out for human consumption is going to be more organic. And there's going to be uh, some new companies coming out in India that are selling nice organic soys as well. So more things are coming out as well. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, let's see. Okay, good. All right. So um, let's look at some of the comments and make sure I'm answering the questions. Okay. So organic foods, as I said, if you can eat organic foods, great. But still, the main thing is to eat a lot of fruits and vegetables and things like that. One thing I can say also about vegetable consumption in India, I know that Punjabi people do this because where I live, we go to Punjabi restaurants and people's houses and stuff like that. Gujarati people do it. Indian people overcook the vegetables. We cook them and cook them and cook them until the color is not longer. Look at the red of the tomato. Look at the you know different colors you see of different foods. And we cook them until everything gets kind of a dark and kind of brownish and everything like that. We overcook. We should be eating some component of raw vegetables like kachumbar, okay? We have to be careful because we have to wash them carefully. You don't want to get sick from raw vegetables in India, but we have to have some component of raw vegetables and some component of cooked vegetables. Cooked foods also give us some advantages, okay? But semi-cook, you know, do it kachapaka, you know, don't overcook, all right? Almond milk. People love to drink almond milk in North America. In India, it's not so popular yet, but it's coming up. But remember, that soy is better than almond milk because in the almond milk, they only have like, you know, three or four almonds in the whole glass of milk. And there's almost no protein in that almond milk, but soy has so many proven benefits. Okay. And uh, high protein, low carb diet. I don't know if it's very popular in India, but you know, people think that they need to eat lots and lots and lots and lots of protein, but eliminate carbohydrates. Well, they don't need to do that. Okay. There's lots of um, examples that people having, you know, uh, that whole grains are good for us, as I was mentioning. We should eat a component of whole grains. My brother wants to know if he can drink it daily. Yes, he can drink it daily, okay? Having a couple of glasses a day is probably very good for you in the long run. I drink, personally, soy milk every single day. I probably have about three glasses a day. And, um, you know, so there's no problem, no problem at all. So you can eat, you can eat soy, you can eat, the, you can eat the little soybeans, the green soybeans, green fresh soybeans. We call them edamame. Can you get that in India? Can somebody tell me if you can get the green fresh soybeans? And you can cook them and you can put them in your sabji. You can put them in, uh, you know, like different things. Like in, in China, you know, I have a lot of good Chinese friends who are also vegan. And uh, they make their traditional breakfast. They cook up soybeans with some rice and, and some other veggies, and they have it for breakfast. So right in the morning, they're having edamame. So those are really great things. I know oatmeal is getting more popular. We make the upma from um, oatmeal now in my house. We take the oatmeal, we grind it a little bit, and we do the same thing, uh, what we make from the cream of wheat, but we use oatmeal, which is healthier because it's a whole grain. And then we can add some tomatoes and different things like that. But, you know, edamame can go in there too. Okay. Um, Superfood tips. So beans and lentils, very important. Soy and soy milk, excellent. Tofu, excellent. Okay. Soy milk and tofu are not exactly a whole food like edamame, but they're like, let's say 75, 80% whole foods. So they're really good. Nuts and seeds, broccoli and kale, you know, and eating the variety. And whole grains. I should put whole grains there. Okay. These transition foods, these veggie meats like Good Dot is now coming into India. And those things are um, really going to be really good. They're not going to be as good as a whole food, but their animal protein is replaced with plant protein. And so you have plant protein in these things. You have plant-based fat. And so the one like Good Dot is a pretty good one. I'm, I'm, I was advising that company on how much protein and how to try and lower the fat a little bit and things like that. And so they... Um, so I'm trying to help those guys a little bit. 
I'm going to skip that. Um, now let's talk about nuts and seeds. So there's chia seeds, pumpkin seeds, peanuts, walnuts, things I did not mention in the slide. The slide contains a few things, but all these different seeds, sesame seeds, all of these seeds are really good every day. We should be eating some of these seeds, you know, but not in a fried food, okay? But we should be eating these, these seeds. I forgot to mention in India, there's a lot of uses of chickpea flour, you know? Uh, there is setu that people use as chickpea flour. They make it as a drink and other foods. Chickpea flour is also a fantastic form of eating pulses, okay? That's a really good Indian indigenous form of protein. Like we should eat a lot of that. But chia seeds are, uh, are chia seeds okay if you take a blood thinner? There's a question there from Kavit. I don't know in particular if uh, any particular seed is bad or good. So basically there are different kinds of blood thinners. People take aspirin and people take also um, uh, things like uh, Plavix um, and um, uh, yeah, they're cladipergel. Yeah, so Plavix. It should not be affected by chia seeds. Okay, chia seeds or all these other seeds are still going to be good for you. They're going to be good for your heart. Okay, it's going to be good for your heart, good for your brain. Okay, so please go ahead and eat a bunch of these seeds. Now, don't eat so much. If you are fat and somebody's overweight and you're eating so much of these seeds, which are high in fat, then you've got to be careful. Eat a little bit because they're good for you, but don't eat it too much. You know, some people sit down and they eat a whole bowl of cashews, you know, or something like that. Um, so don't overdo it necessarily, but eat some of those. And peanuts are also shown to be good. Peanuts are high in fat, but they're shown to be very good for you, right? So eat a lot of these nuts and seeds. And oil. So olive oil is considered a very good oil. Canola, which they also called rapeseed in the UK, is good. And flax oil. Now flax oil tastes very much like ghee. Okay, it tastes very much like ghee. So you can put a little bit of flax oil on your rotis or use it in place of ghee. And flax oil is also considered to be very, very healthy. Now, these oils, when we cook with them, we don't want to take a lot of oil and heat it for high temperatures for a long time because we're destroying and changing the good properties of the oil. When we do our tarka or when we do our, um, what do we call bakar or tarka or those kind of things, we can use just a little bit of oil or you can just use water, or you can skip it all together and add the spices directly. Just start cooking your vegetables and add the spices directly, which is what we sometimes do. But you can also sometimes do it in water, or you can also use a little bit of oil, and then you add your vegetables, then you can add a little bit of more oil, because if you want to, on top of that. So you're not you know, heating your oil to high temperatures. If somebody's frying fried foods, that's creating a lot of trans fats, okay? Uh, a lot of trans fats, so that's not good, okay? Um, and uh, good, so uh, Pupesh is saying they use an oil-free diet. That's great, okay? Now, you can use a little bit of oil. I'm not saying you can't have it all together. And some oil, like flax oil, olive oil, canola oil, also provides us with some nice omega-3s, okay? So that's also good for us, okay? So remember that saturated fat is bad. So right now, there's a fad that coconut oil, people want coconut oil, and they think coconut oil is really great. The studies actually show that it increases your cholesterol levels, okay? Coconut oil is a saturated fat. There's good studies showing that it's increasing your cholesterol. So it may be a little bit better than animal fat, you know, but we're not sure if it's better than animal fat or not, but maybe a little bit better, but it's still raising your cholesterol and it's not good for you. So sometimes a little bit of coconut oil, maybe, but don't eat too much. Palm oil is found in many different foods from biscuits. You'll find it in... Maggie noodles, you'll find palm oil everywhere. It is not good for you as either. Also a major environmental problem, okay? They're killing all these forests and killing these animals to make palm oil. It's really bad that way too. But it's also saturated fat, it's not good for you. Canola, olive oil, flax oil, good. Do not do a lot of frying with these things. Ghee, which is clarified butter. When they heat the butter, it becomes even worse. It becomes more carcinogenic, okay? Um, and cholesterol is from only from animal fats, so eggs and dairy and uh, a cholesterol saturated fat from eggs, dairy and meat, not good. Okay, so go low fat, but eat some of the healthy fats. Okay, and theoretically, we're supposed to eat less of sunflower and safflower because maybe the omega six to omega three ratio, but we don't really know what the long term consequence of that is. So it's not so bad perhaps to eat those things, but just be careful that we're not eating too much oils. Remember about the sweets, okay? Remember about the sweets. Whole foods are better. These are not whole foods. Sweets are not whole foods. Sugar is not a whole food, okay? 
And omega-3s, do we really need to get omega-3s from these fish and everything like that? People are obsessed about omega-3s in Canada and the USA. But initial studies showed that, hey, maybe these things are good for you. But then when they did bigger studies, we found that there was no benefit for the heart or all these things that we initial were, initially were thought were, were good, okay? So we don't really know. Omega-3s, maybe you can just get them from plants, eating walnuts, walnuts and flax seeds when you need a little bit. Maybe that's good enough. But if you really think that you need omega-3 from the ocean, like the fish type of omega-3, it is full of toxin because the ocean is full of toxins, mercury, PCBNs, dioxins, furans, full of toxins. So the only way to get toxin-free marine omega-3 is to get it from algae. Fish originally get it from algae. And what people do is they grow the algae in a clean water, like, in a, like the way they brew beer in a way, but they, they're growing the algae in clean water without toxins, and then they're extracting the omega-3 from there. So that's the only way to get marine uh, omega-3 that is without any toxins is to get it from algae. Okay, so you can get those. But I would just advise taking some flax seeds and things like that every day. And you can grind the flax seeds, put it in your food, and it's very good for you anyways. Okay? But you can get this vegan omega-3. That's the ocean type of omega-3. Fish is not as bad as other meats in terms of your health, but still, there's a lot of toxins. It does increase diabetes, maybe increases some cancers compared to vegan diet. So it's maybe not quite as good as vegan diet. And it has and these toxins, as I said, are very bad. And the oceans are being completely destroyed because you have in the world now 7.5 billion people. And when people are fishing and eating fish, it's destroying everything in the oceans. Okay, so a raw versus cooked diet. I recommend that we have a combination. There are some nutrients that are released more when we cook the food, but don't overcook it. And when we are uh, having raw food, it's really good for us too. So have a combination of raw and semi-cooked, okay? Uh, pregnancy and lactation, can we have vegan babies, vegan pregnancies, vegan breastfeeding? Yes, but make sure you're getting enough protein Make sure you're eating enough calories. Get your B12. Make sure you're getting your calcium, vitamin D, maybe, or iron, omega-3s. You know, do all of those things. Omega-3s may be good for growing children. So that's a time to eat more of your flax foods, ground flax every day, and uh, having things like, um, uh, you know, if those omega-3 supplements that are from marine omega-3s, you can do that, you know. Possibly beneficial. We don't know for sure. But possibly, okay? It's a gray area, all right? Okay. And if you're an athlete, like somebody was mentioning, their brother is an athlete and likes soy, definitely there's so many vegan athletes out there. Remember, you have soy food, but a lot of pulses and whole grains and all those things. Now there are great vegan protein powders. They're a bit expensive in India, but hopefully over time they're going to be cheaper as well. Okay. Things like sattu and things like that is an indigenous uh, Indian protein powder. So that's great as well. Okay, a great way to have flax seeds is to roast and add it to your homemade peanut butter. Definitely, you can roast the flax seeds a little bit, not over roast them. If you roast them too much, remember you're gonna change the property of some of those oils, but a light roasting, a light roasting may be okay. And then you grind it up. When you grind the flax seeds, then you digest it better because the shell is sometimes prevents the digestion of the seed, right? Um, Okay, now, sometimes I find vegans that are underweight. We just have to be smart, okay? If you're underweight, eat more protein foods and eat heavier foods. Eat more whole grains so you get more calories. Eat more healthy fats, okay? Eat foods with some healthy fat in it. Eat some more than you did otherwise, okay? So this you're underweight. If you're overweight vegan, then decrease the amount of fat in your diet and also decrease your carbohydrate intake. Carbohydrates are good. Whole grains are good. Whole grains are definitely good but we have to eat in proportion. Most of us are sitting in front of a computer. We're not farmers. If you're, eating, if you're a farmer, you can eat 20 rotis a day, but if you're you know, just uh, you know, working in an office job, you maybe need two or three rotis a day, you know, so it depends, okay? So, um, uh, so for, again, for pregnancy children, we have to just adapt, okay, our vegan diet, okay? Like I said, do your blood test like once a year, if you find a problem, then adapt, okay? See your doctor. And after a couple of years, when your B12 level and all these things are good, then no problem. Now, one thing to mention, a lot of people say, oh, I have low iron levels in my blood. I have low iron. Well, what does that mean? 
your hemoglobin should be normal. Your blood levels, your red blood cells should be good. But having low ferritin, like ferritin is low in a lot of vegetarians and vegans. They're mostly low. But that may be a good thing because excess iron may increase heart disease, diabetes, and some cancers. Okay, So it actually may be good to have normal hemoglobin and low ferritin. Okay, that's a, that's something that may be good. Okay, all right. So um, remember that, uh, you know, as we eat more plant-based protein, it's much, much more ecological than animal-based foods using less water, less land, etc. okay, compared to milk, dairy, and eggs, all right? Um, I just have a few slides here about the, the, you know, how much of the earth is used for animal agriculture. 30% of the non-frozen surface of the earth is used for animal agriculture. 20% is used for plant-based agriculture, just growing food for humans, okay, directly. 70% um, of all agricultural land is used for animals, you know, maybe up to, maybe not up to 25, but United Nations is now saying up to 14% of greenhouse gases. Some other sources say that it's, that it's, um, uh, uh, a large, uh, a larger amount, you know, different, you know, and uh, using the same land, if people switch to a vegan diet, we can feed extra 4 billion people. Now, that doesn't mean people automatically get food because even right now we have enough food, but we just don't share with each other, unfortunately. But uh, definitely we can grow more food and allow a lot of land to become forests again. And switching to vegan you know, is going to increase the economy because we're going to have lots of new and amazing plant-based agricultures and plant-based foods. Okay. So people worry that if you have um, uh, people switch to vegan, then what are the people, what are all the farmers are going to do? But we have to find them jobs and work in growing plant foods instead of animal foods, right? And uh, we can, like I say, feed so many more people on a vegan diet. In terms of fish, you know, 35 million people fishing with 20 million fishing boats. 30% of the fish populations are collapsed as of 2010. It's getting worse now. And right now people eat from one to three trillion fish per year, okay? One to three trillion fish per year. And that is killing the oceans. That's 30 to 90,000 fish that are getting killed per second. Sorry, they're not eating that many fish. They're taking that many fish from the oceans. And out of that, a lot of the fish is just wasted because it's not the right kind of fish or not the right size of fish. And the net, even though the fishing company says, oh, our net only catches the right kind of fish, that is a complete lie. They're just saying whatever they want to say for marketing purposes. You know, so um, it's really devastating. So in terms of compassion, in terms of environment, in terms of health, it just so happens, it's very rare that you have one thing that you can do that's gonna be better for people better for animals, better for the environment, you know, and it shows that this is truly something that's uh, somehow good in the universe, you know, is eating plant-based food. And I like to end off with quotes from Einstein, who at the end of his life, he, he finally became a vegetarian for these reasons. And he says, our task must be to free ourselves by widening our circle of compassion to embrace all living beings, creatures, and the whole of nature and its beauty. You know, that nothing will benefit the health and increase chances of survival for life on earth as much as evolution to a vegetarian diet. So I would like to replace that with the word of vegan diet now. You know, so, you know, people have been realizing this, you know. And so, you know, um, definitely, you know, people like Bill Gates are, are vegan now for environmental reasons. You know, look up, uh, just look up Tushar vegan and see the, the, slide with the green apple and download my references. Rupa Ben will also help distribute my references. She has them all. So we'll make sure everybody gets it. And uh, my email is tushar, T-U-S-H-A-R dot Toronto at gmail.com. Okay. Fish, Dr. Rupa mentions that fish meal is also given to livestock. So definitely, you know, that's also a lot of our livestock is non-vegetarian now, you know, so that's also a concern. Okay. So, um, I hope that is good. That's the end of the presentation. We can maybe take some questions. Um, I've got to go pretty soon because I have a commitment somewhere. Uh, I've got to go to do a work related thing, but uh, let's see if somebody wants to throw up some questions. You can turn the mics on Rupa Ben and uh, let's, let's go through a few things here. I hope everybody enjoyed, you know, please, uh, Give me any feedback and um yeah so 
um, my mobile number. Um, if you want to get me on, let's say WhatsApp, it's 416-839-1938. I'm having trouble typing here. It's not working. It's saying that I cannot, it's giving me some error message when I try to type anything. Okay. 416-839-1938. That's it. You got it there. Yes. Okay. Um, now, um, is a green smoothie healthy if taken daily in the morning? 100%. Green smoothie is definitely healthy. In my green smoothie, I add some hemp protein powder. Okay, which, uh, so I, I don't just go for soy all the time. I like to mix it up so I have a variety and I get a little bit of different benefits from different things. You know, so, um, but you can have, uh, I put soy milk, a little bit of hemp protein powder or hemp seeds, and then I put some peanut butter. I put some fruits, any kind of fruits that's in season. And I put a little bit of dates. If I want it a bit sweeter, I put some dates. But sometimes the fruit is enough. I don't need to add any other sweetness. And I add some greens. I add all those kind of things. So you can add chia seeds. Fantastic. You know, add all of those things to your smoothie. It's great. Okay. So those are all great ways to get your thoughts. So smoothies are fantastic food. You know, great for your breakfast. Okay. Definitely. Do you want There's to open another up? comment that says vegans are normally seen as hippies and extremists. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Same thing in Canada, you know, but now in Canada, it's becoming more normal, you know, like 10 years ago, if I was a vegan, like I wasn't vegan that time, but it seemed like very extreme. Now it's like everybody's like, oh yeah, I know what vegan is. No problem. All the restaurants here has a vegan option and a lot of young people becoming vegan or at least trying it out. They come vegan then they go back to eating regular food. But even when they go with regular food, they're eating less of the animal foods. So in Canada um, and U.S., there has been a net decrease in dairy consumption and a net decrease in meat consumption, mostly not because of vegans, but mostly because regular meat eaters are eating less meat, you know? So that's good. They're moving in the right direction, you know, and vegans are also increasing. So, you know, this is going to be a growing trend and we see the meat and dairy industry now investing in vegan foods. You know that there's a company called Silk Soya Milk. And there's also have like some, uh, they own some different, different things, uh, different other soy food and vegan foods. That company was bought for $2 billion by Danone, which is Danone makes like yogurts and all these things. A huge dairy company has now bought the soy milk company because they know that their product is going to be eaten less and they better get into the vegan product, which is going to grow. And therefore, you know, and they will promote that. Um, those who are on Facebook, you are welcome to ask questions. I'll be reading them out to Dr. Tusha Mehta. Uh, as start typing if you have any, I'll be reading them. Now somebody's asking about wheatgrass juice. Um, I don't know particular medical research about wheatgrass, okay? But probably like all of the other greens, they probably have a lot of good qualities. The wheatgrass is a very young sprouted kind of thing and it's probably good for you okay so it doesn't mean that you that it replaces other foods you still have to eat all the foods i was talking about but if you throw in some wheatgrass maybe it gives you some extra benefits okay but i don't know any particular research about wheatgrass but i tell you my mom loves wheatgrass and in the summertime she grows it and she she gives it to all of us and fresh every day in the summertime and uh, we all enjoy it so, you know, like, um, uh, there's definitely nothing wrong with it and may have some be good benefits. There's uh, some 1000 dairy shut down in UK alone. since. Wow. Today. That's, that's very interesting. Yeah. You know, over here also, you know, milk is getting less. Soy milk is getting more, but almond milk is also getting a lot more. So I want to tell people that almond milk is okay once in a while for the taste, but soy milk is better. Okay. Now, remember you can also buy soy milk in India. All right. Um, yes. There's also these soy milk makers. Okay. There's a machine that makes soy milk in India. Okay. Um, we should share the number of Sanjay, this guy named Sanjay Jain. And through him, you can order a soy milk machine. Okay. Let me, um, uh, Rupa Ben, do you have his number handy? Sanjay Jain? Yes. Yeah, Sunil, Sunil Jain. Sunil, sorry, Sunil, Sunil Jain. Sunil Jain, give his number there. Now, yeah. put his number. now he makes, uh, he imports a soy milk maker that's very good. And 
you know, the so fit and go vegan. Um, yeah, they're good. Okay. But remember, don't have the sweetened ones. The problem I have a lot of times is they all package in Tetra packs and it's bad for the environment and we don't necessarily recycle them. So I like to have a soy milk maker. And therefore, um, that's really great. But the advantage still of the, of the one from so fit and go vegan, they add calcium to it. Um, they add calcium, they add, um, uh, they add calcium, they add vitamin B12 and those kind of things. So that's the nice thing about SoFit and Go Vegan especially, I think is great. Um, but uh, you can make your own at home as well. If you are making your own soy milk, remember to take your B12 supplement. You can add some to the B12 or you can, um, you can, uh, what do you call it? Um, uh, and, and then make sure you're eating a lot of foods with the calcium and things like that. Jay is asking a really nice question saying, hey doc, what's your secret for energy, <laughs> good looks and warm smile? Yeah, definitely. Well, definitely, you know, I eat a very, very healthy, nutritious vegan diet. My diet includes everything that I told you. You know, I'm practicing what I'm preaching. I also love to exercise. So, you know, I do some, you know, just a little bit of rock climbing, weightlifting, uh, you know, jogging, running, yoga, I combine all of that. Not enough because I'm too busy. I wish I did something like five times a week, but I'm lucky if I do something like two or three times a week for exercise. Sometimes I have a bad week and I don't even sleep enough and I don't exercise either. So I'm not perfect, you know, but definitely a great diet, exercise. And definitely we always try to cultivate a positive attitude. You know, so, so many times you know, you're trying to fight for something like helping animals or changing the environment and we can get very negative and it's really important that we, you know, to develop that positive, good, you know, attitude, you know, I'm not very religious, but I think spirituality is very important regardless of your background, you know, and uh, connecting with nature and things like that, doing some stuff where you're going for trekking and spending some time in nature is also very good. So I think that's a, uh, you know, that's a, uh, those are good things for everybody. Exercise, you know, is, is, not done enough in India, especially, you know, so that's something really important for India. Perception soy milk is not good. If you have want to have a child, that is not true. Soy milk is fine for pregnant women, for breastfeeding women, and it's fine for children over the age of one year. Okay. Over the age of one year, before one year, we should be having breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is the best thing. And if you don't have breastfeeding, then infant formula, especially designed for children under one year of age, okay? And there is also soy formula available for children as well, okay? And for a male, if you want a child, there's no evidence that there's any problem for sperm. Just look north of India, look at China, look at millions and millions of people eating lots and lots of soy, having no problem having kids, you know? In fact, they need to reduce that just like India does so that the population can go into a proper level, okay? All right, so definitely soy is not a problem. If you download my uh, references, Arupa Ben, can you, can you add my, my uh, YouTube video to the chat there where people can download the references? So just go Tushar Vegan, go on your computer because I'm having trouble adding this. Go Tushar Vegan and you'll see under the YouTube videos, there's one YouTube video has a green apple and put the link with this one that has the green apple, okay? I'm not sure why I can, it's not letting me to to put anything in the chat. You know, it's giving me um, uh, more. It's not giving me the option to add anything in the chat. Let's see, Q and A, um, open. Should men limit their intake of soy? Um, you don't have to do that. It's, soy is perfectly healthy for you. Now, let me try to find a particular folder. Um, I'm just looking at all these different things here. Okay. Now, this is something that has a lot of links, and I want a particular link here. Um, here we go. Okay. If you just give us the link of this particular page, then we can search inside the page whatever we want. Maybe. Now, do you see this link that I've given you here in the questions? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, participants are sharing all these YouTube videos of yours. Okay, good, good. Let's Already. see now. Let's so see. We can, we can find many things about your website, your links. 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, um, basically, this, uh, this was a webinar for uh, okay. first introduction for people to get to know you. And now we can sit at our own homes and listen to doctors from across the globe. And so much of knowledge is coming. My goodness. I mean, each yeah. of the webinars are really fantastic. There's so much knowledge. And this is the best way to learn. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And it's great. Um, yes. So that last link there is the nutrition video. Mm. Um, and it's a short, it's a shortened URL. But uh, the nutrition video with the green apple. Okay. That's the one that we want. Okay. And then there's a couple okay. of other videos that people put there that they've seen. I'm trying to remember which yeah. ones those are. You know, I'll check it out. But anyways, I hope that everybody enjoys those videos. And from that point, you, you click the, the see more button. You click the button, see more, download the references and see the references for yourself. Okay. That's important. Okay. Yes. All okay. right. So great. also on the Facebook, they are telling you great presentation. Thank you, doctor. Oh, you're welcome. How many people were on the Facebook? Uh, on and off, there were like 15 people coming and going. Okay, good. And there were, again, same here. There were about 15 or something. Okay, so everybody's saying thank you. Um, thank, thank you, guys, you for everyone. being here. And I yeah. just want to make this announcement that this Sunday will be the last day of Ahinsa Festival. We call it as um, Ahinsa Mela. It's a full day event. Uh, it'll start at 10 o'clock in the morning and we'll go on till 10 in the night. It's truly celebrating Ahinsa. Uh, right now, few of us are celebrating Ahinsa, but someday I, I have a vision that the whole earth will celebrate Ahinsa with all beings together and that we are friends of each other and we don't destroy and eat them, but you know we become friends to them. So I invite and spread the word around and tell more people here are some more days of program still left. We have a brochure like this, Ahinsa Festival. You can also uh, visit our website, ahinsafest.org, and get the daily events detail and you know come. All the events are totally free because that's the way we want to spread the word. But well, thank you very much and namaste to Shar for doing such a wonderful job. Namaste it's really, to all really of you. you know? Thank you for doc to Dr. Rupa. The people thank you have joined from all over. Yeah. And thank actually you. more people keep seeing this video later on as and when they get time. And in about two days, three days, we have hundreds of people. Your first video was seen by more than I think 1000 people. Wow. That's on. amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah. That's great. That's so they're all you. saying thank yeah. you to you. So many of them. Yes. Jimmy, yes. Thank you, yeah. doctor. Welcome. Thanks, 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 everybody. Yeah. Uh, you right. know, thank you, thank you to everybody for attending. And, and also, friends, I, I'll be planning to do more uh, learning from Tushar in future, and we will announce it uh, at appropriate time. How do we want to do this so that we invite Tushar for a topic every now and then and learn from him? Yeah, I want to say thank you to all of you. Okay, thank you to Rupa Ben for all the amazing organizing that she's doing. Uh, check her great book out and I'm looking forward to the book on protein that she told me that she's writing about. I promised. Protein sources. <laughs> if there's a book similar to the last one and Rupa Ben, I want to help to edit it. So show it to me first as well. So I can also give you some suggestions, you know, because I want you to have the best book in the world. And, uh, you know, and, uh, and so check it out. You know, Dr. Rupa is doing so much, you know, she, with this Ahinsa festival and helping to organize the vegan business conference that we have in, in, it's coming up in like January because we talked about it prior and then it became a reality, you know, and uh, so a lot of good things happening. That's going to be good for India, good for people, good for the environment, good for the world, good for animals. And uh, so we'll keep making progress here. Okay. Thank you everybody. All right. There is a vegan business conference. It will be in Mumbai in January, but details will be given out a bit later. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Take care, everyone. Namaste. And uh, okay. we will all talk very soon. All right. Take care. Maybe Namaste. when I come to India, we can or organize a, a lecture or something like that. If you want, uh, Rupa Ben, I can give a, I can give a talk or something like that. If you but like. also doc, Dr. Tushar will be in India in January. Yeah. In January 15th to uh, February 13th, I'll be there. Also one more important YouTube video I want to share, uh, Dr. Rupa, if you don't mind to help share this one, I'm going to, um,
let me see, I'm going to share this one. It's called Dairy Production and Cow Slaughter in India. And I want everybody to see this video. Um, it's very important as well. Let me give it to you right now. Okay. Um, here they are, dairy production and cow slaughter in India. So please share this with everybody as well. I'm putting it into the answer of the questions. Okay, uh, I'm hitting submit. Do you see that? Um, dairy production and cow slaughter in India. If you go to the questions answered, um, uh -huh. then you can see it there because I can't go in the chat. It's not letting me in the chat. Um, yeah, okay. Do you see that? Um, yeah, shared your video. There's an English and Hindi version. There's two versions. Go to the questions, the Q&A, and see these mm -hmm. answers and post the whole thing that I put there, if you don't mind. Okay. Um, I think the one that's there, I want to make sure you get the right version. There's a five minute version. No, the, okay, the one that we put there in the link is not the right version. Put the one that I have. Do you see in the questions answered? Do you see Samarjit's uh, questions there? Go to the Q&A. In the question and answer? Yeah. Go to the question and answer, Q&A. And you can uh, see there, I put dairy production, cow slaughter in India. The answer? Yeah. In the answer. The second it's one? Both of them there. Yeah, the both second one. Okay. Yeah, both of them. Yeah, the, yeah, yeah, everybody can see this. That is the one, yes. That is the one that I want you to see. Samarjit just posted, right? Uh, is it? Um, cow, the dairy production and yeah. cow slaughtered in India. Shorter yeah. version. Okay. Yes, right. The five minute version. And there's a Hindi one as well. See the Hindi one also? Okay. Uh, um, and uh, so there's English and Hindi. So share those. Okay. Perfect. Okay. I want people to share those. Now, Rupa Ben, if you don't mind on WhatsApp, please, sh you have them on WhatsApp, those videos. And I want everybody to see that on WhatsApp. Dairy Production Council. Sure, we, yeah, yeah. We can do that as well. And yeah. this uh, seminar is also recorded, which we will upload a bit later. Right. When I have more time free, then I'll edit it and then upload it on our Ahinsa YouTube site. Perfect. That's great. Okay. We we'll see right. you in January. See you in January. Looking very much forward to meeting everybody. Okay. 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 Bye. Take care. Take care. Bye-bye now.